We have a very special guest right now, and I told you that I, I might be greeting a guest, and she has joined us. And I'm probably going to mispronounce your name, uh, Perla Treviso. And so it's Perla, not Perla. Either I, way, I had a friend uh, uh, when I was in San Antonio who insisted on Perla as the <laughs> as the pronunciation, and uh, a good friend of mine back in those days. So I imagine I'm, I must have correct, pronounced it correctly at least sometimes. Uh, you have written uh, an excellent article that was in the Arizona Daily Star on Sunday, and you followed up with another one today. Uh, you've done some of the best reporting that I've seen locally on the whole immigration crisis, and you introduced us to an immigrant from uh, from uh, South from Central America that I thought was just a great insight to what this this person went through. So I want to first of all congratulate you on that. Thank it's a you. great effort by you and the Star, uh, both of you, to be commended. And I'd like you to uh, to lead our listeners through sort of an examination of, uh, of what you did and how you did it, and tell me tell us more, just for the radio audience, sort of turn our news, your newspaper article into a radio story. And I'm also going to tell you, we're going to have to take a break in a few minutes, so we'll take a break, uh, we'll talk a little bit, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk some more. So thank you for joining us. Just tell me a little bit about, first of all, who is it, the, the, the person, there's a, um, a young lady and her, and her uh, uh, child that came across. So tell me a little bit more about who she is and how you met her and the journey you went along with on with her. She's a 22-year-old um, mother of this six-year-old girl uh, from Guatemala, and she's one of the women who had been dropped off at the Greyhound bus station by Customs and Border Protection. Right. So basically because there's no place to hold family units, as they call them, they're releasing them with a notice to appear before an immigration official at the at their final destination, right. usually so, so where they have relatives. So you met her relatives. at the station. So I met her at the yeah. station, um, what was interesting about this family is that it really showed how it is a intergenerational thing. It's not a you know all of a sudden in many cases that just a young uh, person decides to leave. But right, because in her, her father case, had come over here once before. Her father right. had had come in the mid '90s, which was when the surge of or the spike of Guatemalan migration started, and or from Central America. Then her brother left last year, and she left this year. So really, with through her family, we were able to tell the story about, or through her case, we were able to tell a story of a family right. migrating. So she decided to come up here and with her six-year-old child. And she's what twenty-two. She's now? twenty-two. So she had a child when she was sixteen. Um, did who did, did you mention the father? I don't recall whether I read that or not. We mentioned it in the photo caption. There's okay, so many yeah. things that <laughs> that, right, that right. you're not able to include. So we yeah. we complemented that with the photos. So she was never the the father. Um, never stayed with her they right. were never a couple so she was a single mother and her parents helped raise and the kids and that's kid. a story that we've heard a little bit of because i know i had steve kazachik on last week and he was saying that he's hearing the story too a lot of them you know they were maybe they were married maybe they weren't but now they're being abandoned um now what was the uh, specific thing that caused her to decide and you, you do mention it in the article so just uh, recap it for the radio audience if you would the specific thing that made her decide now is the time to come to the united states they are hearing about the so-called opportunity to come to the United States, that the government's allowing uh, pregnant women, women with children to, to come to the, to the States. So she had been pondering and thinking about it for the last year or so. And when she heard this, it meant that it would be a lot easier um, to make the journey north as opposed to what their, her father and brother did. Right. So she's hearing basically that if you, if you come across, there'll be special privileges. It's what the... Um what our government has said, the whole free, pra- free pass idea, and the government's been trying to get across the point that there's no free pass, but that's what she's been, she heard, basically, she would get special exactly. treatment. But what you really get is that, you know, it's people who are already thinking of leaving, the root causes of what people leave have to be there for this so-called rumor or um, permit or free pass uh, to, free thing, yeah. to, um, to, to have any validity. So it is true that they're hearing this, but at the same time, the root causes have to be there for people to get up and, and leave. And that's what the experts are saying, right. and that's what the families Which are saying. Which for her primarily, number, you talked a lot about the grinding poverty that she lives in. So t- tell us a little bit more about her conditions, that, that, where she was living in her country. So Guatemala, over half of the population lives below the poverty level, which means about earning a little less than $3 a day. Another 15% lives below the extreme poverty level, which means about a dollar twenty-five or less. In the town where she comes from, because this impacts the indigenous communities the most, so the town where she comes from, those those numbers are usually three fourths of the population living below the poverty level. And she talks about how you know when she was a kid before her fa- father migrated, they lived in a house with you know out of mud and straw 
roof um, with no stoves. Her tea set was old sardine cans and rocks. So that just kind of shows the, mm. the poverty that some of these people are living through and the fact that there are no jobs, especially for young people. So you have a very young country, but no formal employment to to help them get out of those poverty levels. And even the education, I was reading, I, I think it was your article, that if, if you want to go to high school in a lot of those countries, you've got to, you've got to pay fees that, that common people just can't afford. And so there's also transportation costs. So, you know, many of you live in the in the rural village. There are not going to be any schools, especially um, higher than primary schools. So many of them have to travel as well um, long distances for that. So you also well, mentioned another proximate cause uh, about a uh, – there, there's, there, there's no question that violence has been – increasing in those countries, and a lot of it's been directed at, at women. So there was an incident not long before she left that made her also feel that, okay, this is just getting out of hand. Exactly, yeah. They, they talk about finding a, a mutilated body of a, of a woman um, just dumped on, in the forest. So they, they were saying that uh, within the last year or so, that town has seen an increasing um, level of violence, and especially violence is affecting uh, younger kids in the capital, in Guatemala City, um, some Departments, which is the equivalent of our states, um, are, are more troublesome or have more problems with violence than others. Right. But that's uh, definitely a contributing factor. All right. So we're going to take a quick break to hear some commercial messages, and then we'll come back and talk more. And what I want to address when we come back is uh, the trip. Uh, what kind of what, what did she encounter when she actually decided to make the trip? How she went about it, and and her experiences when she came when she finally got to the United States. So we're going to continue with uh, Perla Trevisa, uh, Tre- Treviso. Yeah, I got to make sure I pronounce this correctly. I'm with the world's worst on names. I don't know why they let me be a radio talk show host. So we'll be back in a, in about three minutes with uh, with more on uh, this fabulous, this fascinating story in the Arizona Daily Star. Forest Car Show will continue. Hi, you're listening to the Forest Car Show on Power Talk 1210, and we've got about um, well, I guess about a good 12 minutes left before we uh, before we have to uh, say goodbye and take the next newscast. And we're, we're uh, Perla Treviso is a reporter for the Arizona Daily Star and has joined us. And we're talking more about uh, a great story she did. Uh, she and a photographer got to, got to go on a trip with a uh, one of the immigrants that's coming across. And we've heard so much about illegal immigration, but we really haven't had a chance to meet very many of the people that have come across, both for privacy issues and also there's a language barrier there. So, so Perla and her photographer went along with this person, and we just heard that she was living in her uh, in her home country, uh, which refresh my memory. Which what was the name of the country? Guatemala. Guatemala. That's right. Yeah. Shame on me. Uh, my, uh, uh, you get, get to be my age and facts just start falling out of your ears. It's just the most amazing thing, and they just go away. But she's living in her home country. She's in grinding poverty. She's a single mother, 22, year olds, 22 years old with a 6-year-old child, living in grinding poverty. Violence is rising all around her. A woman's uh, body's found in the forest, and then she starts to hear this rumor that uh, she can come to the United States, and she and her child will get special treatment because uh, of a... Of, uh, uh, peculiarity or specificities in the United States law, so she decides now is the time. So having made the decision, now is the time. She's also has a father who doesn't want to see her go, uh, who spent some time in the United States himself trying to save up enough money to get a nice house and those kinds of things in his country. And uh, so the first thing she's got to do is have a conversation with him about, should I go? So tell me how that conversation went. Well, for both her brother and and her, the dad was trying to convince them to, to wait and see if things improved in Guatemala. He knew that, um, you know, a lot of Guatemalans, when they hear about the United States, they think everything's easy. It's a lot of money. They see people go back with nice, buy cars. Uh, they build homes. They buy land. And and they think, you know, the U.S. is the way to go. But having been here, the dad knows that it's a lot harder, um, you know, working uh, long hours for, for sometimes low pay, working very hard jobs. So he was trying to convince them to, to stay and not go. But at the same time, um, this particular family is very religious. So he says, if it's God's will, then so be it. Um, and so he he was resigned and, and he just wished them well. And his dream is that they go back to Guatemala being someone and, and with money saved so they can have their own house and their own land. Right. And it's just amazing to see that when people come back to the United States and they're able to do all the things you just described with the money they earned in jobs that uh, a lot of Americans would turn their noses up. And we know this because we saw uh, states in the uh, the South, and now I forget which one because I don't have it in front of me and my, my, my mind doesn't hold these details anymore, but we saw uh, a state in the in the South succeed in running off its agricultural workers, and next thing you know, nobody wants those jobs, and now crops are rotting in the field. So people come up and they do jobs that Americans tend to turn their noses at, up at, 
Uh, but in fairness, they also get jobs that some Americans would like to have, which is why the thing, everything is so controversial. The bottom line is they come back with an amount of, amount of money that wouldn't seem like a windfall to most Americans, but in the context of their local economy, it's a great deal. An expert said, for example, um, the houses they buy, it's not, a, or that they build, are not mansions. You know, the, the house that he was able to build has four rooms. Um, there's no living rooms. There's no multiple bathrooms, um, but dining it's, rooms. But it's it's cinder block as opposed to mud or, or sometimes they use corrugated metal. But, you know, that house, if he was maybe in the States overall eight years, it would have taken him 30 years to save enough money to build exactly the same house according to experts i spoke with wow okay so he doesn't want his daughter to come but she decides she's got to do it so how did she go about it what's it uh, she uh, she did not ride la, ba la bestia which we've been hearing a lot about she didn't ride the death train uh she did something else so tell us about how yeah. she arranged for the trip and and what it cost her to do this so normally what happens so depending on the the guide or smuggler or pollero or coyote that they use They either go on a bus or the train. Uh, from what I hear and from interviews with, with smugglers and, and, and the press in Guatemala, depends on how much you pay and how much money you have. Right. So the smuggler or the guys there to ensure kind of safe passage. So she got on a bus in, in southern Mexico, essentially went all the way str uh, straight to, to Sonora, to El Paso. So first she's got to cross the border into Mexico. Yes, but she lives, she lives right at the border right. of Mexico, right. and it's a very porous border. Um, from all the news reports and, and from accounts of the migrants themselves, it's not hard. And migration of Guatemalans to Mexico, seasonal migration, has been going on for decades. Right. So that's not uncommon to see Guatemalans cross back and forth to Mexico. So she, they took a bus to, to Chiapas, to the southern state of Mexico. Um, the father and mother and grandparents accompanied them to to make sure that they were fine. Now, then, at this point, let me just clarify: yeah. Has she made contact with a, a smuggler yet? At this point, yet or not? Yeah, most of them use a guide from the beginning. Right, so uh, they've got a guide, so they from, know where to so go. They get on the bus. By that point, she's got a guide. Yes, yeah, so okay. or or at least they've they've given instructions of where to go. Um, right, and how much is she expecting this to cost her at this point? So they they paid. A, so from from what she said, they, she only needed like forty five hundred pesos for the trip to Mexico and then where they charge is more the crossing to the United States. So I, she said they, they charge them another couple thousand dollars. From what I hear, they're giving kind of discounts even to <laughs> unaccompanied minors or women because they don't have to take them. So a lot of the journey is crossing the border, making sure that you don't get detected by Border Patrol and then finding a ride and and kind of like the car that's going to take you to the interior of the country. But they so that's where that the, and they don't need that in this right, case okay. because they're turning themselves in. So the okay. cost in her case was lower than what has been reported. So she gets on the the next bus and continues northward to the Mexican border with the United States. Exactly. What happens there? So she gets to Altar Sonora, which is a, a town um, it's a popular staging area for border, border crossers uh, here close to Tucson on the on the Mexican side. It's a town that it's greatly controlled by cartels and, and smugglers. So she gets there. They take her to a house. So basically, they have little rooms that they rent for the immigrants before they cross to the U.S. I think you described it as a, a flop. A flop house. house. Yeah, they're just you know you walk bed, in and it's thing. yeah it's you just see a lot of rooms um, and and multiple beds, either bunks bed or bunks bed or or, or bigger beds inside the room so they they fit in as many as they can and it's kind of like the waiting time mm -hmm. before they cross so they they get to the border um the 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 smuggler walks them right i guess from what she describes seem to the line between mexico and the u.s and says just keep walking and border patrol will find you and so that's what happened and it takes uh, the next morning right she leaves in the evening yeah and the, she gets the, the problem is that they didn't see border patrol as soon as they thought so they 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 had limited water they didn't have food She was traveling with a total of seven people. Uh, most, they were all minors. There was a pregnant girl, um, and they're running out of water. They, they didn't carry any food because they were told it would be 10 minutes before right. Border Patrol gets so it's them. it's more than 10 minutes. It's more than 10 minutes. They end up staying the night in the desert. The next morning, they continue to walk, and, and they spot a Border Patrol agent, and they get apprehended. Okay, so now they're in custody. They're in custody. What happens at that point? They're taken to the Tucson Border Patrol Station here on Swan and Goff Links. They're, that's where they're processed. Let me pause for a second. Tell me again where they crossed. Where did they cross? They crossed by Lukeville. Lukeville. Okay. So, so they're, in the, they're in the Tucson sector, and they get brought to, to, to the, the To the station. They get processed. They, they spend a night there. Um, 
while they get their paperwork, and the following day they're dropped off at the Greyhound bus station. Now, at this point, uh, Border Patrol is... Um that we know that they're going to release her on their own recognizance, and they've been doing this because they're just so overwhelmed. And it's mostly ICE, so Border Patrol then gives right. custody to ICE to because ICE, ICE right. is Immigrations and Customs, customs Enforcement. Enforcement. They, they have the detention. Uh, they deal with the detention of the of the immigrants. Now, do they work with her to get her on the phone or do whatever she needs to do? And she's coming, she's coming to see – she's going to join a brother, right? So what do, do they do anything at all to help her arrange for him – to send her the money she needs for the ticket and those sorts of things, or do they leave her to sink or swim on her own as far as that's no, concerned? No, they did. Uh, at the beginning, when, when we start seeing women dropped off from Texas, so there was a search in Texas. They start flying women and children to the Tucson sector to get processed and then dropped off at the bus station. There was criticism that Border Patrol and ICE were just leaving them without access to phone, without knowing where to get their bus ticket or contact right. family members. But with her... Uh, they, she had a yellow sticky note with a confirmation number, meaning that someone in Border Patrol made contact with a brother so he could send money and purchase her bus tickets. Okay, so they helped her. They helped her make sure she had those communications, but they're not buying the bus ticket. No, for her. the brother's doing that. The family members right. have to send them. Now, where the does money. the brother live? Delaware. Now let's fast forward to Delaware because we're running out of time. Mm-hmm. We've got about two minutes left. Uh, she gets on the bus. She goes to Delaware. And she meets up with her brother, who's living in a and not you know palatial accommodations by any means. It's like a it's a small trailer. It's right? a mobile home, yeah. Yeah. So she gets there, and now she's got to figure out what to do next. She's been she's got the orders to report to immigration authorities once she gets there, and uh, where you sort of leave the story is she's got to figure out if she wants to do that. So what's going through her mind? What would you say is going through her mind right now? She knows that that's what she has to do, and there are consequences to not showing up. You can become a, a fugitive, and and. Any chance you would, might have had of staying, you lose it by not showing up. But at the same time, there's this big <clears throat> weight that they have that, you know, they this is kind of all they they work for, and and they borrow money to get all the way to to where they get. And if they get deported, not only do they get do they go back without fulfilling their goals and meeting their dreams, but now they they owe money that they have no way of paying right. back. And, this, and we know this happens because people get caught, and they they've uh, not only spent every dime that they have. On, uh, on the passage, but uh, maybe they owe some. And th- the thought is, they've come to the country, they're going to be able to earn a wage and pay this money back. But if they don't, if they get deported, now they're in, they're in a worse hole than they were before. And that's a big problem right now in places like Guatemala, because a lot of people are signing um, the deeds to their homes or their land, so that's all they own. And, and people are losing their properties or their land, and that's kind of what your grandfather had and left to your dad, and your dad is leaving to you, and so it is. It, it is being. Um, it is a, a huge problem right now in some communities. So she and we can, by extension, think that, you know know that there are tens of thousands like her, basically have rolled the dice and are betting everything on the generosity of this great nation. Yeah, and it's a very complex issue. There's no simple solution, you know, on on both sides. I want to congratulate you on a, a fabulous, a fabulous article, and I'm very glad to know that the star. Um, uh, it would let you take you and your photographer take this trip and do this story, which was incredibly insightful. And I want to thank you for joining us on the on the show. Today. Thank you for having me. It's really really kind of you to physically come here, so we could have good quality on the interview. I will um, post this interview if my recording at home uh, worked out, and I'm trying to do this. Uh, I will post this portion of the of the show on uh, my blog, the Bashful Bloviator blog. It should be there by later today. Thank you for joining us on the Forest Car Show. Uh, It's uh, time for the news, and we will see you again at the same place tomorrow.